Welcome to A Conversation with History. I'm Harry Chrysler of the Institute of International Studies. Our distinguished guest today is General Anthony Zinni, who is the 2007 Sanford S. Elberg Lecturer in International Studies. General Zinni is a decorated Vietnam War veteran and a four-star retired Marine General. From 1997 to 2000, he served as head of the Central Command responsible for U.S. forces in the Middle East, Africa, and Central Asia. During the 1990s, he led U.S. relief operations in Turkey and Iraq, the former Soviet Union, and Somalia. His newest book is The Battle for Peace, A Frontline Vision of America's Power and Purpose, written with Tony Colts. General Zinni, welcome back to Berkeley. Thank you, Harry. Good to be back. What are the lessons we can draw from the Iraq War? Well, I think uh, there are a number of lessons. I, I, I think uh, you, the principal lesson might be that in the case of a democracy, and particularly ours, you can't just take the military to war. You have to take the, the country to war if that's what you choose to do or if that's what you see uh, as the requirement. I think, secondly, the rationale for engaging in a war, especially if it's going to be unilateral and unprovoked it, uh, directly, uh, has to, the case has to be clear. Uh, if it becomes uh, questionable afterwards, I think it works against the kind of support that's necessary for our democracy to function in that environment. I think you have to understand the culture that you're operating in. You can't believe that you can use uh, Western concepts, Western ideology, that, and, and, and think that it's going to naturally take hold. I think you also have to understand the dynamics that are going on within that culture, within the region, and be careful that what you think you're about to do may be entirely different than what you unleash. So I think those are amongst the key things that we should learn from this uh, intervention. And you, as head of the Central Command, really put in place the, the, uh, the strategy of containing Saddam, uh, keeping him in the box, which before the war, the realists were, were telling us really was working. Right, and, and actually we did it very efficiently and, and effectively, I think, uh, as, as proven by the fact that Saddam didn't have weapons of mass destruction. He was no longer a threat to the region or perceived as such. Uh, we did it without additional troops. We, we did it with fewer troops on a day-to-day -day basis and all of Central Command that, that go to work at the Pentagon every day. Uh, we did it uh, with the support of allies in the region and outside the region that helped us uh, uh, retain the sanctions, UN uh, resolution approved sanctions. Uh, we did it in a way that we built alliances and friend friendships that uh, not only shared the burden, but when we went to places like Somalia, into the Balkans, they actually were there with us. The, the Saudis, the Kuwaitis, the Emiratis, the Egyptians, the Jordanians all provided forces. So the idea of containment really formed by President Bush 41 in the aftermath of the Gulf War I thought was effective. And, and for those in the region and those in the international community, especially since we had UN authority, uh, I think th th they thought this was the appropriate way to, ha to handle the situation and prevent these instabilities from exploding into something larger. Uh, uh, Ambassador Joseph Wilson was a guest on our program and we talked about his book. Uh, and in that book, he he saw as a turning point the passage of the regime change law in the, uh, uh, in the late 1990s. And he pointed out that you were one of the few people, if not the only person, to red flag that legislation. Talk a little about that, because that was part of the buildup of the momentum which was in place, and then we were struck by the events of 201. At, the, at sort of the end of the 90s, mid to toward the end of the 90s, there was a, a movement to begin to look at how internally we could affect regime change. I, th I think it was misguided in many ways. There was, there was sort of a, 
uh, maybe a bill of goods that was being sold by the Iraqi National Congress, Ahmed Shalabi and company, and a number of others operating as exiles and convincing uh, the so-called neoconservatives and members of Congress and others that given proper funding and support, they could work to undermine uh, Saddam's regime and could actually create some sort of uh, insurgency or revolution. I saw it as flawed for several reasons. One, they had no credibility inside Iraq. There wasn't going to be a popular uprising that supported them. Uh, there was no regional support for it. They were discredited for many reasons, their leadership and, and their motivation. They were infiltrated in terms of uh, Saddam's intelligence forces that understood what they were doing. Uh, they had tried and attempted to do this before and were badly beaten in the attempts. But most importantly, I really felt that if we went down that road, we were going to be drug into something we didn't control and we didn't understand. I mean, uh, Shalabi and company were, aver were uh, condoning uh, uh, an approval for the use of our military, our air support special forces, in total support of them. So we would have signed on to whatever they did or brought about. Uh, and again, I saw us being drug into something that we hadn't thought through completely. And I didn't really trust the leadership. And this was based on the intelligence we had. So this Iraqi Liberation Act, which initially uh, authorized $97 million uh, for the support of this, I saw as a step or a beginning to, to draw us into something that we would regret and something that wasn't being thought out totally, what the consequences might be in the end. Uh in your book, you're laying out a, an agenda for the United States that takes account of the realities in the world now that we're beyond the Cold War and, and in a new millennium. Let's talk about that. How, how has the world changed? Because before we can really talk about threats, we really have to say, hey, this is a different world and this is why. I think it became a very different world beginning in 1989, 1990 with the collapse of the Soviet Union. Uh, this sort of half century of, of two superpowers that sort of controlled everything, in many ways determined many of the outcomes, loyalties, uh, uh, structures in the world, had now just simply evaporated. I think it unleashed or at least became a catalyst for other things that, that began to, to rise up. Uh, for example, globalization where it be, began in an economic sense but moved into maybe global governance and other areas. Uh, it generated the rise of non-state entities, uh, some out trying to do good, restructure society, some obviously not so good, terrorist organizations, extremists, drug cartels, etc. It gave rise to the information age, the exchange of information. Obviously, we, we had the internet, we had the ease uh, uh, through information technology of, of gaining a lot of information and communicating. Access to, to technology was greater. It encouraged and allowed more migrations, almost diasporas in many cases that changed uh, the uh, complexion of societies. And I think it opened up a floodgate of a whole series of things whose confluence then changed the world. Rise of new powers, uh, changing some of the, the ways we interacted. I think sovereignty and the, and the role of the nation state was diminished a great deal. And I think that it also encouraged a rise in instability because many ways, because it was a zero sum game, the superpowers bought off loyalty and support. That was no longer there. So the natural instabilities uh, either generated by nature, generated by, by man, caused by ethnic and religious differences, all began to rise to the top. And, and, and these began to generate a whole series of unstable conditions around the world that manifested itself in a way that increasingly was washing up on our shores. And we were missing this. I think we believed there would be a peace dividend, a natural reordering, and this was beginning to happen around us when we still looked past it. I also think we weren't prepared for it, and, and we hadn't made the adjustments or the, ad, or the adaptations to deal with it. Mm -hmm. the, the theme that uh, emerges throughout your book, and I'm going to quote from you here, you, because these, these global events uh, which create instability uh, interact with, with, with this point which you're making, complex ways that history and geography have molded people into whatever they have become and how they have evolved a different point of view of the world and ours. In other words, things are going on in the local area 
which are a, a product of history and geography. And we have to keep that in our mind because it's the interface with that reality with these global events. Talk a little about that. Well, I, I think all those things really are the definition of w the composition of culture. I mean, we are a product of all those things uh, over time. Uh, history, geography, you know, the traditions, beliefs, and all the systems that go into to making up what, a, what might define a culture. That culture is, is, is what we have, is the prism through which we have to deal with changes, all the changes I mentioned, and deal with the onslaught of modernity. For some societies, it may be easier to cope with that, like ours, although we have certainly difficulties in many ways. For more traditional or conservative societies, it may be much harder. Uh, the Islamic world now, 1.23 billion people, uh, undergoing a tremendous transition and maybe the first part of this century will be defined as to how well that transition goes. But they're trying to absorb modernity, sort through it and see what they can benefit from this, but at the same time uh, make sure that this doesn't compromise their, their beliefs, their culture. Uh, is there some sort of way that they can square that uh, with their culture? Uh, when we enter that society and we attempt to change it, uh, and change it in our model, it, 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 it won't work necessarily. Uh, in many cases, the change needs to come. There are, there are things and practices that obviously, like the role of women and other things, that I think generally are accepted that, that need to evolve and change. But how will that come about? How can they bring forward the traditions they value and shape them in a way to accept the forces of modernity that are coming over them. So when we intervene, like, much like we did in Iraq and elsewhere, we have to understand this. We, you know, we may find that, that there's nothing in Islam, for example, that I think that prevents representative government. Will it be Jeffersonian democracy as, as we know it? Well, certainly I don't think so, certainly not in the short term. It may be some sort of compromise, a constitutional monarchy with some representative form of government and it will have to evolve maybe more slowly over time. So I think we have to be careful about bringing the goals and objectives we may have formed in the way we have evolved and try to impose them on a society. Uh, in your book, you, you talk a lot about your experiences as a soldier and then an officer and then a commander. Uh, let's talk a little about that because really you began to see some of this as far back as the Vietnam War when you, you were a soldier. Uh, and so give us an example of that where you came to see that the theories emanating out of Washington and guiding our policy really had no interface with, with the culture that you were dealing with. Well, as a, as a young lieutenant, my first tour of duty in Vietnam, uh, was as an advisor to the Vietnamese Marines. And to prepare for that, I had to learn lang the Vietnamese language taught to us by Vietnamese families in uh, Fort Bragg, North Carolina, through the course I went through, that not only taught us language, but taught us uh, much about the culture. When I went there, I was immersed in, in the culture, in the society. We wore the uniforms of the Vietnamese. I rarely saw another American. Uh, we lived amongst the people. They had a quartering act, for example, so when we were in operations around the villages, we literally moved in with the families and the villagers. And I came away from that experience a year later, having seen a different war than my, my colleagues who were with U.S. units and operating uh, in, in sort of a, a, a bubble in isolation within the culture society. I saw the war from the pers perspective of the Vietnamese people, and I saw a much different war. And I saw in many ways that it certainly wasn't going to be determined by just military successes. You know, I mean, we won every battle on the, on the, on the so-called battlefield and still did not win the war. And I saw that, that this was truly, and we mouthed the words correctly, this was an issue of hearts and minds, but the kinds of things that would have drawn from the people that kind of commitment would have generated the kind of hope, would have connected to them, weren't really going on on the ground. Uh, we were attempting to resolve this issue through, purely through the use of force and, and battlefield determination of, of the end state. And I saw that that wasn't going to occur. The society had to be with you. The people had to be committed. They had to understand that there was benefit that they could see. And that wasn't happening. And, and so really, as we, we try to come to an understanding of what the threats are out there, 
uh, if, if one, if, if the military or the Americans who are intervening don't come with this subtle, uh, sophisticated analysis that you're describing, then we may help exacerbate what is a potential threat, not necessarily from the Kurds, but the instability that Saddam was creating. We intervene, and if we, we, we try to help and we don't understand the situation, we've got problems. Well, I think that's true, I, I, you know, and, and I think the military is well aware of this now. There's a major effort ongoing to provide cultural understanding as part of what we in the military would term the estimate of the situation. It's more than just the military equation and the military factors. The military, more than anybody else, and you can hear this quoted by the, the generals and colonels on the ground in Iraq, that there's, there's not a military solution to these kinds of conflicts. They're not fought on the same terms that determine previous uh, world wars and other conflicts that were between nation states and fought in accordance with some sort of uh, set of conditions or conventions. And they see the need to have stronger partnerships in these environments from those that represent uh, the, the political, the economic, the social uh, kinds of things that need to be affected on the ground, if it's going to be reconstruction, if it's going to be development, uh, if it's going to be construction, if it's into a society that's never even known the kinds of things that, that we're promoting, like democracy or free market economies or that sort of thing. And the flaw has been that the military understands how to do its end of the business. And, and, and that's become more difficult lately. But we don't have those partnerships, the other agencies, the other non-governmental and governmental agencies that are up to the task. And that's been one of the failures in Iraq, too. Mm -hmm. And we'll talk about that in a minute. Uh, uh, after you left the military, you, your, your skills as a negotiator and a diplomat were called on. And, and you talk in the book about the case of the Philippines where you were uh, trying to mediate uh, between uh, a rebel group and the government. Uh, and, and you say you have to understand who they really are, that is the adversary, where they really come from and how their goals grow out of their own environment. And this will be make you a more powerful mm -hmm. negotiator. Talk a little about that because it's, yeah. it's given the way our foreign policy is going, that's the one thing that we don't do. No, and, uh, and I've had these experiences many times with the uh, Israeli-Palestinian situation and, and Indonesia and Africa and many places and, and other places where I've been asked to participate in mediation or facilitation. The first requirement is, is not just to understand the ex existing situation or not just to go after a set of, of goals or objectives, but again, you have to understand the history uh, the cultural evolution of what brought this about, because rarely are these things uh, short-term events or they've evolved very recently. Uh, and if you don't have the depth of understanding or the roots of the issues and the problems and of the people you're dealing with uh, on, on each side, then I think you're less effective as a mediator or a facilitator in some way to bring them toward uh, some sort of peaceful resolution of their differences and, and their issues. And, and oftentimes, they may come at this with an end state uh, that isn't going to be able to, to be worked out in a, in a peaceful, compromising way. And so you have to peel them back from the end state and talk more about the objectives and what they're seeking so that alternative end states could be offered as a way of maybe accommodating those. I mean, for example, rebel groups often say what we desire, what we want is, is independence. Uh, down the road, maybe independence just creates a non-viable state, would never be agreed to by the primary state. And so it's not going to be a, a negotiable I issue. But what is it that they expect independence to bring them if, if it's a degree of, of, of greater share of economic uh, prosperity, if it's more political freedom and representation? Maybe that can be dealt with in some other means, some sort of uh, granting of autonomy, some sort of restructuring and governance. Uh, but you have to, again, peel it back to what are the objectives, what are the perceived wrongs or real wrongs that have been done in order to get there. And again, that requires that depth of understanding that you've alluded to. Uh, as, as head of Central Command, you really uh, uh, had a bird's eye view of a, of a contradiction, or at least I'm going to ask you if, if I'm right about this. On the one hand, the enormous military power 
that we have, the, the control of information, the new uh, technologies being applied on the battlefield, making military victory possible. Uh, and, and one has to say that looking at it afar, that kind of power must really con uh, make our leaders, not necessarily our military leaders, think that we can do anything. But on the other hand, once you put troops on the ground, the boots on the ground, then you come up against the realities that, that you're, you're talking about, where you have to have knowledge of the culture, knowledge of the language, and so on, if you're going to turn the military victory into a stable situation. How, how do we reconcile those two, and what is the problem of leadership in recognizing these two distinct realities? Well, first of all, military power is very blunt. Uh, and it is not the means to resolve every issue. Uh, in some ways, it can contribute or assist. It could provide a secure uh, environment, for example, where y you're able to maybe reconstruct societies in some ways, again, economic, political, social. Uh, but the military is not the end answer. It, it is designed to confront uh, other military threats and to win on the battlefield. It is in, in its sort of uh, ultimate form, uh, the release of kinetic energy, and it doesn't determine anything in it of itself unless something's built around it. For example, the Second World War, which is probably the greatest expression of our military power, uh, we created in such a short period of time from the day Pearl Harbor was attacked until, you know, victory in Europe, victory in Japan, this tremendous military machine. It accomplished the military task that was assigned to it. But the real victory came in the reconstruction of those societies. I and mean, what we did afterward, if you think about Truman's Marshall Plan, the creation of NATO as a deterrent entity to prevent a, a, a third uh, world conflict, uh, uh, the way we helped uh, bring those societies out of the ashes, where it wasn't retribution, much like after the First World War, uh, it was a sense of restructuring them into uh, societies that could better cope with uh, the, the new world and be less hostile, less militant, uh, helping put an end to colonialism and imperialism and the other things that, had, uh, that, that uh, changed the world for the worse. These kinds of things were what really won in the end. The military, uh, the use of our military power wasn't, didn't bring, back, bring about the end state we wanted. Uh, I think you can go back to the end of World War I and see the same thing. Even though we had won, had we followed Wilson's vision to, to truly gain victory, his view is 14 points, his creation of the League of Nations, by not doing that, we didn't capitalize on a military victory. In and of itself, that didn't present us with the kind of stability and end state we desired. At the end of World War II, because of the things that Truman, Marshall, Kennan, and others did, that, that vision, that strategic application, that looking at the other elements of power, uh, diplomacy, economic power, the, how we reach down and communicate, how we affect uh, uh, social connections and, and, uh, to bring about change. They were much more effective in the end at truly achieving the goal that the military allowed you to be in position to accomplish, but in and of itself couldn't accomplish. Mm -hmm. but before we talk about this failure that you've just identified, which really uh, must be foisted on the, the political leaders, uh, 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 who may not be comparable to the ones that we had at the, uh, the beginning of, of the Cold War. I, I want to talk a little about the military, because I think what you're saying is the, that in some ways the military has adopted, but in other ways it's stuck in the Cold War. Uh, you, you talk about uh, uh, the, the, the goals of the military, uh, few casualties uh, in a conflict, the use of technology, extended battlefield, clear-cut moral purpose uh, to, to make the war popular and so on, on the, on the one hand. But now we're, we're confronting the, this different kind of war where you have to worry about the aftermath. And you're saying, really, you know, uh, the soldiers, our soldiers, in addition to being the master of this weaponry, uh, in this F information technology, they have to be part political scientist, part economist, part anthropologist, and so on. So what, what, what is the score you give the military? Well, I think the, the military understands that it was created, it was designed, it is tasked to do things that don't fill completely the requirement in, in today's uh, conflicts. And, and, 
And, but the question becomes, how much of that should be their responsibility? They consistently find themselves stuck with those other aspects. They consistently find themselves stuck with reconstructing societies, nation building, if you will. Is that really what we want our military to be about? Uh, in the absence of other capabilities on the ground, we've seen the failure in Iraq, for example, of the Coalition Provisional Authority, Bremer's group, and his, that predecessor to that, the ORHA, the Off Office of Reconstruction and Humanitarian Affairs, or whatever it was that uh, came in initially. We weren't prepared to do these other things, and so when they failed or they were incapable, the military's left with the problem. I think the military has to understand how to support those kinds of missions. Certainly we bring to the table things like logistics power, we bring the power for emergency relief, we bring the power to retain order and create a, a, a secure environment for these things to flourish in. But to step beyond that and, and go to the point where we become the instruments of political change or reconstruction, economic change reconstruction, even social reconstruction. I think maybe more than we want our military to do or is appropriate. Mm -hmm. And so we're faced with a dilemma. If we're going to, to look out at reshaping the world or being involved in its reshaping, and in many ways I don't think we can help it because as, as things become unstable, they threaten us, they threaten uh, world security in many ways. We get thrown into these situations. You know, Iraq's a bad uh, example because we, that was one of choice, but Afghanistan and others may be different. And places where we go in for humanitarian reasons may be different. But we need to create the capabilities that complement the military contributions in this kind of conflict. Uh, the military, by the same token, has to adapt. Uh, the military is structured based uh, on world wars of the last century, on threats like the Soviet threat at the end of the century. It's based to basically deal with conventional and other kinds of threats that we deal with. It is not the kind of military that easily can adapt to these kinds of uh, reconstruction of societies, the instabilities and how they're generated. Uh, in many cases, an enemy that the term the military uses that chooses to approach you on an asymmetric basis, in other words, to not face you where your power is, but to find ways to undermine it in, in other ways. They, uh, they tend to uh, do things that make it difficult by the way we're designed, structured, tasked, and by the, the, the rules that we uh, apply to, to a conflict that we, we find difficulty in operating. So it's a much different world, and we have to make these adjustments not only within the military, but we have to look at the void we have and these other capabilities that are required. You fault uh, the, the post-Cold War War presidents, basically, for not addressing uh, the problems uh, that we've been talking about. Uh, the new instabilities, the threats emerging, how do you uh, uh, address those problems? Talk a little about that. Some presidents get better grades than others in this post-Cold War world, but, but all of them just haven't grappled with the problems we're talking about at the strategic level. Yeah, I think there are mixed reviews. I think in some cases the presidents have done things that, uh, that were positive. In other cases, they, they failed. I, President Bush 41, the first President Bush, obviously at the beginning of this change, uh, certain actions that he took, for example, uh, in dealing with Saddam Hussein in the initial incursion into Kuwait, he went through the painstaking process of, uh, of, of gaining a UN resolution as the authority to act. Uh, he built this coalition to, to ensure, uh, especially in the Islamic world, that, that, that on the battlefield that, that this represented the total force of not just Western powers or others from the outside, but had regional support and commitment. Uh, at the end of the expulsion of Kuwait, uh, he did not go to Baghdad. I, first of all, I think that was smart, but, uh, but secondly, it, uh, what it demonstrated, and I was traveling around the world at the time talking to you know, all sorts of, of, of leaders, military and political leaders, and, and they thought that this was remarkable, that as the sole remaining superpower who could unilaterally do anything we wanted, we chose to stay within the framework of the international agreements and resolutions. We built a containment policy afterwards and the sanctions, enforced it with a coalition. Uh, and, and so that model w was appreciated, that even though we didn't have to, we were choosing to build partnerships, to build international and regional relationships. I think in many ways the Clinton administration talked a lot about engagement 
and shaping of environments. I think this is more maybe Truman-esque in, in, in its approach to let's go out and see where we can help and change mm -hmm. things positively. I think it saw more in, in, in not shaping things in our model or, or imposing or in, inflicting our ways of doing things, but find ways that worked within their culture. Uh, I think in many ways the Bush administration, uh, in, the, through the frustration and also saw, saw the need for more energy and activity out there, maybe you know, arguably misguided by the unilateral approach and the use of the military as the lead element. But they all failed in some respects in my mind if they didn't understand the scope of this change. It required new strategic thinking a new understanding of this changing world. It required a restructuring of our own government, much as President Truman did in the 1947 National Security Act. He saw his government structure wasn't capable of, of operating in this world. No business would operate like our government does. This sort of bloated bureaucracy, heavily layered, very stovepipe, failed us on 9-11, failed us in Katrina. There are, there are uh, leftover uh, legacy systems that don't work anymore, patronage systems where there's greater value placed on political contributions and loyalties and friendships than, than there is on competence. Uh, again, we saw that in Katrina and in Iraq. Uh, systems like our earmark and pork system where our, our, the treasure with its limitations aren't applied to the most productive way. Uh, the way everything has become so heavily politicized in this environment and is so short term in its vision, there's nothing that goes on in our government that has any kind of long term perspective. I just had a senator tell me, you know, the, the, long, the, the document with the longest horizon that we produce is the five year budget out of the Congress. And really the budget's reviewed every year, so it's not even really five years. The administration is supposed to articulate a national security strategy and update it every year, but it really isn't a strategy. It's sort of a statement of values and principles that is everything to all people, but doesn't really offer guidance, doesn't explain how, uh, uh, the priorities we have, the allocation of resources, the vision for where we want to be, an articulation of the world as it is. You know, so we have failed because we've become political and not visionary and strategic in our thinking, and we have failed in many ways because we have not restructured our government. I, I do a lot of work in business now. No business could operate today with that kind of structure. It needs to flatten itself, streamline itself, integrate itself, be dynamic and changing because that's the nature of the world today. Mm -hmm. So <clears throat> how do you, uh, uh, it's, it's a pretty telling indictment that you've just made, and, and how, do you, how do you explain the difference in the leadership that you talked about earlier, those who were present at the creation of the Cold War, Atchison, Marshall, uh, McCloy, uh, and of course President Truman. And how do you compare that with our failure to do this? And, and you're really saying the three administrations have, have mm -hmm. uh, failed to do this adequately, both Bush and Clinton. Well, what's the reason for that? Uh, well, I, I think there's several reasons. One, the change didn't come about at the end of some sort of cataclysmic event. There wasn't a world war and then a defining moment, a surrender, a defeat. Uh, it's easier to understand change when you look back at, you know, Kissinger says there's been five reorderings in the modern uh, world, you know, beginning with the Peace of Westphalia and, and then on to 1870, then three in the last century. But they all come at the end of major uh, conflicts that are clearly decided and, and the end can be clearly seen. And, and, the, and the change in the power structure and the, and the effect on how it changes society is maybe is crisper, clearer, and, and sort of defined in, in a moment. Uh, this came about so subtly. I mean, we were unprepared for the collapse of the Soviet Union. It was a, a whimper rather than, a, than an explosion. And then it unleashed all these other things that maybe we didn't grasp. This, this sort of rise of globalization, the rise of the information age, the, the migrations and the movements that occurred, the rise of the non-state actors. All these things began to, to happen over time and maybe even in some cases very subtle ways. So in their defense, it didn't have that kind of, 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 of crisp, uh, clear uh, presentation of, of, of change. And it seems, especially when you come out of this as, as the sole remaining superpower, that there's, there is no real threat out there. Hmm. And some of the threats, again, are hard to connect directly. Uh, you know, if somebody's growing 
poppies or cocoa leaves somewhere. You've got to draw that line to what becomes heroin and crack on our streets. If someone cannot make a living and not survive and decides I need to go where I can, those migrations uh, that occur, you may not see the effects uh, directly and understand that that unstable condition has generated this. Uh, uh, somebody's upset and angry, especially the youth, over their political, economic, social conditions, how that plays into non-state entities, uh, extremist groups or whatever that, be, that, that begin to comp, uh, uh, really uh, take advantage of that and, and, and turn that anger into something hostile that has global reach. You know, so it isn't as clear as it used to be when you thought in terms of your enemies, if you will, your threats being nation states or coalitions of nation states or political ideologies. Now it's changed. It's, it's a much greater mixed and even more subtle bag of, of threats. Ha, uh, you know, in, in that earlier period, uh, as I recall, when uh, they went before the Congress of the Marshall Plan, the Vandenberg, I think, who was the head of the Foreign Relations Committee, told them, advise the administration to scare the hell out of the people to get that legislation passed. Well, we're, we're beyond that mm -hmm. now. And I'm just curious, because in a way, you could look at what, uh, uh, in their limited sort of way, the Bush administration tried to scare the hell out of yeah. people, you know, about something that, that was not the threat, the pressing threat that they thought. So I guess the, the key question becomes, how do you educate people? Because you have to have a constituency yeah for these changes at home? I, I don't think fear works in the end. I, I mean, I think what got us through the Second World War was FDR, all we have to fear is fear itself. I think those, uh, the success of the Reagan administration may be more that, that he, had, he built a sense of confidence. You have a feeling that we're going to get through this. Uh, uh, the things that we face, we, we're better than. We can overcome it. We may make mistakes, but, but we'll learn from our mistakes and improve. I think the, the American people want to hear that. And, and I believe that although that the case you made about initially the fear, which certainly was there. I remember in first grade going to school with a pillowcase because mm -hmm. we had to pull it over our heads, mm -hmm. dive under the desk. We, we, we ended up building this sort of confidence, the ability that we will prevail, uh, the things we believe in, uh, you know, democracy, uh, the freedoms that we hold, eventually will win out. Uh, you know, uh, and I think what we haven't done, you know, given this administration, we've played to the fear. We haven't done enough about the confidence. Again, this nation hasn't been taken to war, and war may be the wrong metaphor for what we face today uh, because it, it, it tends to, to lead people to believe it's, a, it's going to be won or lost on a battlefield somewhere. And I don't believe that's the case here. There will be battles, but it's part of a conflict that has many other dimensions, maybe more uh, dimensions that will be more uh, effective in determining outcomes uh, than just the, the, the military or security side of, of these sorts of things. And, and I think that, that that that's been the mistake. The administration has been groping to define this. Think about what's going on now. They began by calling this the global war on terrorism. We declared a war on a tactic that doesn't make sense. I mean, FDR didn't declare war on, on uh, uh, kamikaze attacks or Wilson on U-boat attacks. They saw it much differently, broader, the scope wider. Uh, if you think of it in terms of, of a tactical level, then you fight it at a tactical level. Osama bin Laden probably understands clearly that his strength comes from this endless flow of angry young men uh, who come, and the anger is generated by some political, economic, or social set of conditions it generated. If the anger isn't dealt with, then he's not going to have a problem. He may be defeated tactically in some ways, but eventually this thing morphs from an organization to a movement, you know, to an ideology, uh, which has happened now uh, over time. And, and so I think that if you don't get the context and you don't understand it, you don't think through how you can overcome it, operate in that environment, succeed, and then communicate that, your point, to the people. And I think you can't underestimate the American people's ability to, to grasp that. One of the mistakes we made in Vietnam was the justification became this Gulf of Tonkin ginned up excuse. And later when that was disproved, your credibility is gone. This has been this uh, to be kind, embellished, exaggerated intelligence on weapons of mass destruction and association with Al Qaeda that was never there. I saw the intelligence right up to the day of the war; it was never there. The vice president was talking about Saddam amassing 
weapons of mass destruction along his borders to, to threaten his neighbors. I mean, totally untrue. Mushroom clouds, the spin and the evoking of these images that had no basis in, 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 in intelligence fact. Uh, once that's discredited, you've lost the people. If your rationale for doing this was strategic, and it probably was, uh, you have to explain that strategy. You, you have to understand. The American people understood the strategy during the Cold War. They understood deterrence and containment, basically. And we operated within that strategy. We've articulated no strategic vision and no description of the new world and its changes. And so we have a populace that basically still has its mind in the Cold War era, a government that's structured basically the same way, and we're trying to operate the different era, environment and era. Mm -hmm. You propose as a way of being able to address some of these problems, to, to get the intelligence and information uh, uh, about crises before they become crises, and you call for a national monitoring and planning center to essentially anticipate, act, and, and thereby lessen the cost. Talk a little about that. Well, the, the, the term that's being used around Washington now by people that have been around the government that understand that this stovepipe uh, uh, system that we have, loaded bureaucracy that isn't integrated, doesn't cross-communicate, is that we need a, a quote, Goldwater Nichols Act for the interagency, the government. Goldwater Nichols legislation integrated the military. You know, we had these four services that operated independently. Uh, Senators Goldwater, Nichols, and others really saw the inefficiencies, the need to bring them together, the synergy that could be created, uh, how much better we could be. And they passed legislation that was very much resisted by the services, and it was a success. Mm -hmm. We have successfully integrated our military to a degree that benefits the taxpayer and our, and our capabilities much more than we had before. People see the same need for the government, the State Department, Department of Defense, other agencies of government that don't communicate, the failures of 9-11, of even the 16 intelligence agencies of mm -hmm. communicating and interacting uh, together. Uh, so, as a matter of fact, right now, this sort of creation of a war czar that's gotten so much attention is a manifestation of that problem mm -hmm. because the president was saying, I can't get interagency coordination and cooperation to do what I feel should be done in Iraq. Therefore, I have to create some sort of entity that that can do this tasking and pull it together and articulate the requirements for integration. Uh, and, but what it is, is it's a Band-Aid on a bigger problem. There needs to be some organization, some integrating organization, that the president could count on. Let me give you an example. Let's take Iraq. There was a debate on the intelligence before going into Iraq. You had elements in the Department of Defense that believe that this weapons of mass destruction program, association with al-Qaeda, was at some level that warranted intervention. You had others in the CIA and elsewhere that didn't believe it. You had this, you know, great disparity in views. Who brings that together? Who allows the, the decision makers to understand what's the basis for this disagreement? You know, who, what are the sources? What are the credibility of the sources? Why do they look at this thing and see it differently? So that's why my recommendation is that in one respect, you need to present the differences and be able to explain why. The second part of that is there is nothing we do now that purely falls within the authority and realm of a single agency. I don't care what it is, even if it's going to war, mm -hmm. conducting diplomacy. You can't do anything today without all agencies, or virtually all agencies of government, on the same sheet of music, having the same priorities, contributing their share to the programs and planning that you're building. Again, I'll go back to Iraq. In Iraq, we had a war plan. Uh, as a matter of fact, the one that we had should have been the one that was used, if, 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 rather than the, the, the sort of hip pocket uh, in, in effect. We would have had enough troops. We would have had enough troops. But even having said that, there were still flaws in that plan. The flaw in the original plan is we had a military plan. We didn't have a then what plan, a, a, a reconstruction plan. Mm. There was no planning. There never has been done at the end of a military intervention as to what you do next. If we were to go to war with North Korea today, there is certainly a plan, one that for 50 some years has been uh, it developed and evolved on, on how and, and every year reviewed and gamed and everything else. But what happens next? What happens once you close on Pyongyang or uh, as we closed on Baghdad when the, when the statue came down, when we arrived in Mogadishu uh, to set up a security environment? 
there's none of this planning about the other aspects of this. Within a security environment, you have to restructure a society. You know, it's not the business of the military again. And so that's why I suggest something that, and an entity that works on this. It doesn't have to do all the elements of planning. It shouldn't be doing the military planning for the Department of Defense or the diplomacy planning for the Department of State. But it should bring those plans together, ensure they're done, and then marry them up in some sort of cohesive uh, uh, plan. More important than the plan itself is the planning, because that's where you see these problems, these issues, what needs to be done, and you condition yourself and your whole organization that, you know, if the event comes, there's this depth of understanding, you know, in, in, in just the planning that, that was done. What I hear you saying uh, in your analysis and in the book is that we have a real problem with the unbalanced power within the government to address these political military issues over time. So, uh, and, and how do we deal with that? I mean, because it, yeah. it's a real kind of unbalance. You, you mentioned in the book that when you were head of Central Command that you often had trouble finding the plans that you wanted from the other parts uh, of the government <clears throat> that represented other parts of American power. Yeah. Well, it, it's, it's a very difficult system to operate in because authority is, is dispersed, uh, uh, resources are dispersed, and you can't, as, as I said before, you can't do anything without bringing uh, the areas that all these agencies of government work in together to get a plan. If, if I'm the commander of U.S. Central Command, and I want to begin to structure a, a plan to create a regional security arrangement, let's say in the, in, the, in the Gulf, the Persian Gulf, and you want to bring together organizations to say, you know, we want to help you build your security environment, or in Africa, if you want to help them uh, understand how they can build a peacekeeping or a humanitarian in, uh, disaster relief intervention capability. It's not just a military function. It's a State Department function. It's, it's a function of probably several agencies of government at a minimum not to mention other branches. You have to bring in congressional support and uh, resources and other things. There's no one way, for example, for a commander of, of a regional combatant command like CENTCOM to do it. There's no one way, even if you gained a partnership of cooperation of your counterpart, let's say the, the, the Assistant Secretary of State for African Affairs, in the State Department. It is such a convoluted system and there's, it, it, it doesn't come together in any way. And so you, you can't integrate it. You can't build these sort of collaborative uh, processes and, and build these collaborative programs that allow you to do this. Uh, the president can order it and be defeated by the bureaucracy in many ways because uh, 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 of what, uh, how much gets stovepiped down. And this is a feudal system, our government. The barons are the heads of agencies and departments. And they, they don't communicate and interact very well. We haven't, we've had very few examples, especially in modern times when our government has really grown and where they see th things the same way or cooperate. In their defense in some ways, the problem is more systemic than it is personality-wise. You know, if, for example, when I was at CENTCOM, we in the military were doing things in the area of, of counter-narcotics. There were military aspects of this. We were helping train some border patrol military units. We, we participated in some of the monitoring and other things. But the State Department had a program. You know, the Department of Justice had a program. When you looked at on the ground in places that you, where you had this problem and you were trying to help maybe uh, uh, nations work this problem, they were confused because they had these stovepipe interventions from our government, and when they would ask us how this fit, we didn't know because it didn't fit. We didn't even communicate on things like that. You, you, you've thought a lot about leadership. You're, you're a leader yourself. Uh, what, what kind of political leadership do we need uh, to address these problems and bring the people along? We, we, we seem to do very well in the military sector. Uh, leaders such as yourself, who we uh, uh, brought forth, uh, and in the business sector. So, so there, there seems to be some, some sort of vacuum in the area of political leadership and we're really saying here that we have systemic problems that we have to address to deal with these instabilities which really threaten us. 
Well, I, I think part of the problem is, is the politics in the, in, in the way the system develops political leaders. It is so heavily politicized, it's hard to get beyond the politics. Politics tends to be continuous and short term. We now go from one election cycle right into another. You go from a presidential election year right into the midterm political cycle and then back into the presidential cycle. Uh, I suggest in the book a six-year presidency with no, uh, uh, no ability to, to succeed yourself and that our requirement on the president would be that he, he no longer can participate in campaigning that we legislate against that, that he no longer would have political advisors in the White House. Uh, I mean, where the American people know the political advisor and who he is better than they know who the national security advisor is or, or other key people that, that, that are more about the business of the country uh, rather than the business of the politics. So I think the first problem of political leadership is politics. If politics has now overrun statesmanship is, is, is overrun, how we think through foreign policy. You know, it wasn't that long ago where our congressmen and women were proud not to have a passport, you know, which is ridiculous in this sort of shrunken planet and the need to understand them and all the things we've been talking about now, what goes on in the world. Uh, they were, were more happy to be totally uh, immersed in, in their own politics, in their own uh, narrow constitu constituency, in many ways misreading their own constituency, which we could see as elections have surprised uh, uh, people as they've gone along. And uh, we are, politics creates the era of spin now, especially because of the way we can communicate now, the information technology that's out there. Everybody has to uh, take truth and spin it to some degree in the way they want to portray it. And so it becomes even difficult to find hard truth out there. And so we're more involved in shaping political mindsets mm -hmm. as opposed to getting a truth and understanding how to deal with it. Plus I go back to what's the political advantage to, to thinking long term? What's the political advantage to being a strategic thinker? What's the political advantage today in, in doing things for the greater good as opposed for the narrow good of po a political constituency. We have evolved to this point that to be successful in politics, it doesn't attract the kinds of individuals that are going to be necessary to effectively deal with this world. And part of that might be our fault, that, that we encourage and, and, and we support that. Then we lament the fact that that's the kind of leadership we have afterwards. What, what, will, be, what will shake things up? Uh, uh, because obviously things need to be shaken up. I mean, is, does the, the, for example, the problem of global warming provide an opportunity? I know that you were, uh, were part of a group of military officers who just released a report mm -hmm. raising the question of the security implications right. of global warming. Uh, what I'm getting at is, is, is we, are we going to have to confront a threat uh, that we then define in such a way that then leads us to these kinds of reorganizations that you're talking about? Yeah, I don't think it's only, the, the, the nature of threat has changed greatly. It, it, I had a friend that described it, and I mentioned in a book, he sort of used the, the metaphor, if you will, of we slept with a cobra for 50 years, that being the Soviet Union, mm. the ability to one bite, we could destroy us. I mean, we, mutual destruction was certainly a, a possibility. We wake up one day and the cobra is dead and we, we rejoice, but now the room is full of bees. <laughs> now, and, and no one bee can kill you, but a lot of bee things can certainly damage you. We face this, this room full of bees in many ways. Some of these bees, like I believe climate change could be very significant in effect and change the world and, you know, in, in, in many ways as we know it. Uh, and it's not that far off. You need to be thinking about it now because you can mitigate against the ill effects of, of what is partly a nat natural climate change that's being exacerbated by some of the practices uh, like the release of, uh, of greenhouse gases and other things that we do. Uh, but some of that change is going to happen anyway, and, and it may be manageable, but it will require adjustment. You, you have to think through it and, uh, ahead of time because you've got to prepare yourself for it. Our, our, our group looked at the security implications, but there are other implications, economic, social, political, and, and all sorts of other implications. But in my mind, what, we have, what we're failing to do is, again, look ahead, understand what we face, what we face now and what we're, we're facing in the future, and then put in place the kinds of capabilities to deal with it. Uh, the reason for part of the title in the book being America's Power and Purpose 
you know, what are we here to do in the 21st century? In the past, we sort of followed Jefferson's uh, advice and, and tried to remain the, the bright shining beacon, you know, uh, that everybody could look up to and model themselves afterward. In some cases, the reluctant interventionists that went in to try to change or shape things. We've now become more intervening, but without that sort of uh, idea of the beacon and, and, and with the, uh, the, 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 the bringing in the kinds of things based on principles and values that we have, more down to what we see as immediate practical reasons for doing it, which reduce, I think, our image in other people's eyes. But we're losing something that I think the rest of the world sees as our power and purpose, the ability to lead and unite. We are sort of disavowing our engagement in any international or re regional structures to deal with these issues. You know, my experience in Africa, and I've spent a long time there, is the vast majority of Africans want to find a way to handle their own problems. Now, they don't have the wherewithal. You know, for example, on the military side, they would come to me and say, look, help train us, help give us the capability, we'll put the boots on the ground help us deal with our issues that tend to be these issues of conflict, issues of health, uh, health uh, issues of, of, of hum humanitarian uh, disasters and catastrophes. Give us the capacity and allow us to develop the ability to handle it. And we don't do that. You know, we don't invest in that. That's in our interest because eventually it's going to draw us in. And, and we don't do well when our boots are on the ground in those kinds of environments. So I see our power and purpose is we are going to have to build in this shrinking planet, the global institutions that can cope and deal with these problems. We're going to have to lead in that respect. Uh, if we don't assume that, I think we're going to fail in what truly is our power and purpose and maybe what caused us to be the sole remaining superpower. We've, we've survived and prospered based on principles and approaches and things that we have done and, and recognition of failures that we have had that we can't lose sight of. You need to continue that. I, you know, almost everywhere I go, especially in the, in, in the Middle East, people will come up and say, you know, I, I have to tell you this, we don't hate Americans. You know, mm -hmm. why you believe that? We don't hate Americans. We may hate your policy. We may dislike it, but you need to understand you as a people, the freedoms and the values you possess, your education mm -hmm. system, the things that are important to us. But more importantly, they keep saying, you know, and I actually had, right after 9-11, a, a Muslim friend of mine that called me and says, whatever you do, don't stop being America. Mm -hmm. You have your right to, to get justice, to retaliate on what has happened, and, and it'll be our internal shame that it came from our part of the world. But don't stop being America. Don't change your values and your standards and your, your principles because of that, because he said, we need that. General Zinni, on, on that hope for the future and the hope that, that we might change so that we can realize what we truly are, I want to thank you very much for being we're here with you. Thank you, For Eric. being here with us. And I want to show your book again, The Battle for Peace, uh, which I recommend highly. So thank you very much. Thank you. And thank you very much for joining us for this conversation with history.